Well, we can do a little bit better than that. The Chiefs are winning. Good afternoon. All right. We're very fortunate to have uh, quite a few children here today. That's always great. And so I would like to invite the children, if they would come up and join me at the front. Our young children, if you'd come and join me up front, I have a story I think you'll probably like. Sit right here. You can sit back. Ah, good. Oh, here comes some more. I may have you sit right here. Yeah. Oh, good. Come in. Come in. Oh, this is great. This is great. Okay, I want to read a story, but at first I got to ask you a question, and this is a hard question. But what does the word visible mean? What does, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, so invisible means you can't see it. Yeah, that's a good word. Uh, like, see these big lights up here? There's electricity in them. But you can't see the electricity. But if the electricity wasn't there, we'd all be sitting in the dark. And sometimes we need to know that there are things that are invisible that are real. So I want to read you a wonderful story called The Invisible String. And if you want to come a little closer, you can. Lisa and Jeremy, the twins, were asleep one calm and quiet night. Oh, suddenly it began to rain very hard. Thunder rumbled again so loud that it woke them up. Mommy, mommy, they cried as they ran to her. Don't you worry, you two. It's just a storm making all that noise. You go back to bed. No, we want to stay close to you because we're scared. Mom said, you know, we're always together no matter what. So why are you scared? Well, how can we be together when you're out here and we're in there in bed? Mom held up something right in front of their eyes and said, this is how. Well, rubbing their sleepy little eyes, the twins looked closer to see what mommy was holding. And they came closer. I was about your age when my mommy first told me about the invisible string. I don't see a string, said Jeremy. Well, you don't always need to see the invisible string. Because people who love each other are always made by very, connected by a very special string made of love. Well, if you can't see it, how do you know it's there, asked Lisa. Oh, even though you can't see it with your eyes, you can feel it with your heart. And you always know that you're connected to everyone you love. So when you're at school and you miss me, your love travels all the way along the string until I feel a tug of my heart. And when you tug it right back, we feel it in our hearts, said Jeremy. Well, does Jasper the cat have an invisible string? She sure does, says Mom. And what about best friends like me and Lucy? Oh yeah, best friends too. Well, how far can the string reach? Anywhere and everywhere, Mom said. Well, would it reach me if I were a submarine captain you in the ocean, asked Jeremy. Yup, Mom said, even there. Or if I were a mountain climber, even there. Okay, what if I were a ballerina in France, even there. A jungle explorer, even there. Okay. What if I were an astronaut in outer space? Yeah, even there. Then Jeremy very quietly said, Yeah, that's like the thunder for the storm. Yeah. <laughs> Can our string reach all the way to Uncle Brian in heaven? <coughs> yup, there too. Well, does the string of go away when you get mad at us? Never said Mom. Because love is stronger than anger. And as long as there's love in your heart, the string will always be there, even when you get older and you can't agree about things like which movie to see or who gets to ride in the front seat or what time to go to bed. That's right, you two should be in bed right now. With that, they all laughed as mom chased the twins back to their beds. Within just a few minutes, they were sound asleep, even though the storm was still making the same loud noises outside. And as they slept, they started dreaming of all the invisible strings they have and the strings their friends have and their friends have. Tell everybody in the whole world 
was connected by invisible strings. And from deep inside, they can now clearly see that no one is ever really alone. Now, I brought some strings for you. Now, you can see these, and I want you to think about making something out of these. You might make a necklace, you might make a bracelet, uh, you might make something to put your favorite toy on. And some of these you're going to have to tie. Okay, and you've got one. And just, who doesn't have one? You don't, and you don't. All right, and you can think of something in your brain to make with them. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming, and remember that when you love someone, you're always connected, no matter what. All right, I'll let you go back to your seats. Thank you. Now, in case you don't get that story, have a child explain it to you. <laughs> but if I don't say anything else, I hope you know we are always connected to those we love. <coughs> Death is not an amputation. It is a change. Um, have you ever been driving in your car and uh, you're enjoying the drive, but your children or grandchildren aren't? Anybody know this experience? And do you ever hear this? When are we going to get here? Aren't we there yet? And you go, well, we're getting closer. We're almost there. And even as adults, one person in the car will start saying, how much further is it? This is longer than I thought, and this is certainly not worth it. You know, bridges are a vital part of our lives. Uh, the guy at the library said, oh, you want to go to the train station? Go over the bridge. And that's a, apparently important communication. But think of some of the great bridges you've been on. Anybody been on the Golden Gate Bridge in California? Or the Verlano Bridge in New York? Uh, there's these great, great, incredible bridges. And you go, okay, we came here before we get snacks so we can talk about bridges exactly. Because what does a bridge do? A bridge takes you from where you've been over some danger to where you're going. And otherwise, you know, if there weren't a bridge out here, how would we have gotten over here? And I think that's what happens with grief. That in fact, grief is a bridge that takes us from where we were, where we liked everything just the way it was, everything was comfortable, and it takes us over this dangerous feeling. What am I supposed to feel now? And probably some of you have had people tell you, well, you should have been over it by now. And, and people sometimes say stupid things to grievers. It's a wonder to me more people aren't beaten severely about the head and shoulders in funeral homes. Because they just walk in and say stupid things. I mean, just, it's amazing. And you as a griever are supposed to be so gracious and go, well, I hadn't thought of that, but thank you for sharing that with me. Now, bridges, sometimes there's a congressman or a senator that decides they need a bridge. In Alaska, they decided they needed a bridge between the mainland and this little island of 50 people. 50 people. Now, you got to get this right. It's not like, you know, it's a massive. 50 people. And you know, then they decided they ought to spend $250 million of your taxpayer dollars to build this bridge. And soon it began being called the Bridge to Nowhere. And then people got riled up about it and the bridge never got built. So I guess the people on the island are still stuck there. But in grief, you either are on a bridge to somewhere or you're on a bridge to nowhere. And I'm not talking about forgetting your loved one, because that I don't believe in at all. Now, some people fear bridges. I have a disease called uh, gyrophobia, which means you get me on a bridge and I start breathing deep 
and I close my eyes. Sometimes when I'm driving a car, that has happened. I, 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 I've never fallen off a bridge. I've nearly, never nearly driven off a bridge. But you get me off the ground on a bridge and I get very, very uncomfortable. Well, that's the way some people are with death and dying. You know, if, if nothing else this holiday season, you can be so grateful for hospice. Because those are the people that understand the bridge. And they've helped so many people get across the bridge. And you're blessed to have been helped. In my family, I could not get my sister's husband to agree to hospice. In fact, he'd been my brother-in-law for 41 years, and he said, you just want her dead. Hospice kills people. I took a deep breath and I said, this conversation is over. How dare you say something? And we had to watch my sister die the most God-awful death. She did not have to die. But hospice, oh no, because you can't tell him anything. And he's heard all about hospice. And he's on that bridge and is not getting anywhere on that bridge because he's got all these weighty feelings on him. Now, there are several types of bridge builders. The first of these are the deniers. They want to deny death. Oh, oh no, we're doing just fine. Thank you for asking. We're doing just fine. It was hard at first. We're doing just fine. And they say, we want to stay right here. We don't want to go over the bridge. This is where everything was so comfortable. We, we want it like it was. Well, it's not going to be that way. Then the second are the edifice builders. Those are the people who say, in the history of mankind, no one has ever grieved like I've grieved. I worked with a young widow. Uh, she had only been married about two years. And at the funeral home, her mother-in-law said, I, I don't know why you're so upset. You only had him for two years. I had him for 27 years. And, and has anybody kind of suggested that, that they have more right, but nobody has ever, or have you ever been trying to talk about your grief, they go, you think that's, I'll tell you what grief is, and then suddenly they're not listening to you. Have any of you felt better when somebody left? Because they sure weren't helping you while they were there. Third, though, are the K-taggers. I drove down from Kansas City, and I got my little ticket at the turnpike, and so I come to the end of the turnpike, and I had to cough up money. Meanwhile, all these people that had whatever a K-tag is, just kept whizzing by me, and I saw their taillights. Me, I'm trying to find the right number of coins and, and give it. Well, that's the way some people are. I want to get in the express link. What is the quickest I can get over this bridge? What is the quickest I can get over grief? And St. Luke's, I have said to some people, you know, your problem is you're trying to get over it. You've never gotten into it. And it's like some of you will remember the Fram Ultra Filter commercial. Anybody remember that? You can pay me now or you can pay me later, but you are going to pay for grief. And then there are the todayers. Those people are people who just take one or two steps forward and they take one or two steps forward and they're trying to get over that bridge. Some days they take three steps forward and they slide back too, but they're still ahead by one. I like the way Karen Humphrey said it. I have enough sense to survive today. I can't make sense of all that has happened right now and I don't like it but I can handle it. Let me talk to you about three bridge builders. The first is one you'll remember, she comes to mind this season of the year, Jackie Kennedy. And we always remember, well, it was X number of years ago, Jack Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. And, and some people don't stop to realize, or don't know, that Jackie was already grieving because in August she had buried that little baby, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. And you know, so many millions of people were praying for that baby to live. How could that baby die? And some of you may have asked a question like this. Your friends were praying, all these people, but still that baby died and now the impossible thing has happened to her. Her husband's been assassinated. 
Uh, at Christmas time, because really that's what you got to face, how do we get through these holidays? Somebody came out to spend the weekend with her and they bought presents for Caroline and John John. And after the kids opened the present, they went to bed, yeah, they had some adult conversation and they talked about, well, you know, this is a tough thing. And uh, they said, you're young, you'll probably get over this. You'll probably marry again. You'll probably have even more children. Jackie Kennedy was irate. They come into her home just weeks after her husband had been assassinated. And they're saying she's got some kind of future. We now know that Jackie Kennedy was suicidal. In fact, she told her priest, I want to take my life. She could not deal with the laws. But she did write a thank you note to these people who sent the gifts. And this is what she said. You must know that I consider my life to be over. And I will spend the rest of my life waiting for it really to be over. And that's tempting in grief. That is very, very tempting in grief. But you see, we have to deal with how do I live with life on the bridge after my loved one has gone. The second was Andrew Jackson. Now, a lot of people don't think of Andrew Jackson as having a much emotions. He'd just soon shoot, shoot you as a look at you. Matter of fact, when he went through an assassination attempt, he took his cane and beat the man senseless right there in front of the White House. That'll teach you to try to assassinate me. But you have to go back to that Christmas 1828, he had just been elected president. In fact, he thought he had been elected four years earlier, and John Quincy Adams won the election. And he and Rachel were planning they're going to Washington in just a few weeks to be inaugurated. She was buying clothes she would need to be the first lady. And on Christmas Eve, she had a massive heart attack and died. Andrew Jackson loved Rachel with an incredible love. And he decides, I can't be president without Rachel. And he said to his good friend, John Coffey, my mind is so disturbed that I can scarcely write. In short, my dear friend, my heart is nearly broke. And you're going, that guy with his nearly broke heart is going to be president? And if you had told him, you can do this, you can do this. <laughs> And not only just get through being president, you will be one of our greatest presidents. The third, and I've got to hurry, is a guy by the name of Harry Truman. Now, Harry Truman was a mama's boy. Martha, the sunshine of Martha's, his mother's love, shone wherever Harry Truman was. But she died in 1947. He was the president of the United States, but he was grieving deeply because he thought she was the only person in America who believed he could win in 1948 if he won again. Now, that one vote he was sure he would have had is gone. Harry Truman grieved enormously. In fact, he had a secret room in the White House that he went and locked the door so he could grieve for his mother. Well, now they're beginning to make decisions. What are we going to do about the holidays? Because it takes a lot to bring the President of the United States to Kansas City for the holidays. You've got to have Secret Service, you've got to have all these people. And yet Harry Truman in his mind knew he could not face Christmas in Kansas City without driving down to Grandview to Mama's. He could not do it. This the man made a decision to drop two atomic bombs and went to sleep that night. But he could not face what some of you are facing. Harry Truman was asking that same question in the White House. What are we going to do about the holidays? Well, he knew what he couldn't do, and so he decided, let's try what I can do, which is great advice. He invited all the Truman tribe to come to Kansas City and have dinner in the White House. And, and some of the Trumans did. Still, Harry Truman couldn't get over what was churning in his heart. My mom is not here this Christmas. That Christmas Eve, about midnight, everybody had gone to bed. Harry Truman was still up. He took out his diary and he wrote some words. And here's what he said. It was a pretty good Christmas. 
all things considered. Pretty good Christmas, all things considered. For some of you, Harry Truman's words might be appropriate for you. It is a pretty good Christmas, all things considered. But we've got to get through Thanksgiving. And some of you would say, can you please tell me what I've got to be thankful for? Yeah, I will. Can you be thankful you had all those years? Whether it was 20 years, 40 years, 60 years. Can you be thankful that you were beloved? Somebody loved you so deeply. Can you be thankful there was a mother or father that loved you with an unconditional love and it didn't matter what, they loved you. A lot of people don't get that kind of marriage. They never taste that kind of love. Can you be grateful in those worst hours? Hospice was here, Great Lakes Hospice, and they knew what to do. How would you have made it through that experience without hospice? Can you be grateful for all those people who came to a funeral home or a church and hugged your neck and shook your hand and told you they were thinking about you? If there's anything they could do for you, just to call them and they would be thinking about you. This year, I have worked for Speaks Funeral Home. I've done some funerals, hardly anybody there. And you're watching the clock get closer to starting time and you go, where is everybody? Where are the friends and family? That's a hard funeral for me to do. But very few of you had that. People came, they brought you casseroles, they sent you Hallmark cards, and they kept loving you, and sometimes they handed you Kleenex and just said, have at it. I wish I had a magic wand. I wish I did. And, and if I waved that magic wand, you'd start feeling thanks, and by, you know, after you've had some of the snacks over here, you'd be feeling right down good. You, you'd say, I believe I found some hope in the train station. I'm going to do better. There are two prayers I'd like to offer you. And they're really good for any religion. The first of these is from Rabbi David Wolpe. Very simple. You can memorize it in about two tries. God, stay close. Just God, stay close. And the second one is something you're going to hear children singing before long. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever. We're all on a bridge. I'm on a bridge this year. My sister-in-law died in July. It's going to be a really different Christmas. And we're all on the bridge. But you've got to decide, are you on the bridge to nowhere or you are on the bridge to somewhere? I bet when you were small, you were exposed by your parents to that eminent philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. Anybody remember that? And I'm looking around, I bet some of you had Pooh t-shirts or Pooh pajamas or you had Pooh all over your room. Well, but now you're adults, so you've probably forgotten one of those great pieces of wisdom that came from Pooh. Here it is. If there ever is a tomorrow when we're not together, there is something you must remember always. You are braver than you believe. You are stronger than you seem. And you are smarter than you think. But the most important to remember is this, even if we're apart, I'll always be with you. That's what the invisible string is about. People don't disappear, but they are there. I memorized a new quote today, and some of you, I bet, didn't even look. It's over here with those pictures and the memorial cards. It says, when a loved one becomes a memory, okay, then a memory becomes a treasure. Few of you volunteered to walk the bridge. Matter of fact, for some of you, this is the last place you thought you'd be this Sunday afternoon. 
But look around. You're not alone. Look at all the people who fill these chairs. Why? We're on a journey together. Very few of us are going to be K-taggers on that bridge. Reality is, I need you. Reality is, you need me. And if nothing else this afternoon, I want to salute your courage that you came. It had been, been much easier to found a coffee shop somewhere and just hung out there. It had been easier to stay in your robe and pajamas at home watching the TV. But it tells me your most courageous people and you have come to be with other courageous people. Remember, when a loved one becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure.